So let me get back into this again. Now, Hoko River, <laughs> I know I started talking about something, but at Hoko River, we have these tools, and uh, we believe that it is a, a woman's technology. We find it Hoko River. Uh, one of the things that traditionally here in the Northwest Coast, men didn't do, and that was clean fish, salmon particularly. Uh, it's just one of those behaviors they didn't do. Uh, and, uh, you know, as an experiment, we took a bunch of these replicated tools up to a Nia Bay, and the Macaw women were filleting the salmon out. Big old salmon now. <laughs> Hit them all flayed out, traditional North Coast, West, Northwest Coast style, in the back flayed out and ready for the, the barbecue and or the, the smoking. And, and so we gave her some of these tools and she took one of these big salmon down, slapped it down, took a look at the tool, and went, huh, and they went, had it all flayed out in the same amount of time. And the thing with this technology, with the vein quartz pebbles, these little white rocks, is that uh, the whole technology takes 70 yards from the time they go to the quarry, which is out on the beach. They gather these things. They come back up to the site. And they have this big anvil stone like this. And they smack on these things and knock these little blades. They use them. And then they deposit them back into the river. Um, and we find lots and lots of these things. Now, the problem with what we find there is that for 70 years, we call these orange sections the tools in the archaeological record. We call them PSS key A's. Um, and this is what we find at Hoka River they're throwing away. Um, and for seven years, we've known they stunk as wood wedges. But that's what we call them, the French term for wood wedges. Uh -huh. But it was the little bitty flakes that we were chucking that we didn't know what, you know what it was, that they were actually hafting under tools like this. Mm -hmm. So having a wet site like at Hoka River and Ozette, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, lucky that we're able to find tools that represent exactly what people were doing back there. And probably one of the most important things that we see here on the Northwest Coast uh, is that the environment was so friendly in a sense. You know, it's very temperate here. There's more food than anybody needs around here. You could live you know, easily even in the winter, in winter time out here in the Puget Sound area. Um, so one of the things that we see developing between five and 3,000 years ago here in Northwest Coast are some of the basic Northwest cultural patterns that have been around, you know, that we know that people keep ideas around five to 10,000 years. You know, we see this in Western religion, you know, Christianity and Judaism, it goes back five, 10,000 years. Um, so we know there are certain behaviors that are around. One of the things you don't touch up at Nia Bay is a McCall woman steal. You get your fingers cut off. There's things in mom's kitchen and garage and dad's garage you don't mess with, you know, as we're growing up, and those kind of things are there. Um, but it's basically what we find in cultures with a lot of surplus, people develop a variety of specialists. And here in Northwest Coast, we find people developing a variety of cultural specialists, from politicians to, to uh, religionists, um, through master tool makers, um, canoe builders, house builders, OK? And uh, one of the things that we see with natural peoples is that the flint napper, and with any group of people you find, anywhere from 30 to 50 people in a hunting and gathering group, you're bound to find two or three people that are just great at it. And you're bound to find two or three people that just can't do it. And then you're going to have a whole range of people from Ds to Bs that, that are really good to those that are. Uh. And uh, what we often see in the museums tend to be items that were made by a master flint napper for, a, for special things, like for an ancestor's afterlife, going into an ancestor's life with a, with a spectacular tool. Um, but you see, in terms of your everyday tools, and you go back through most museums and take a look what they've got in the back, what you see are what you call your average abos, and these are things that work. And they're not long, thin, nice projectile points. They tend to be very thick, clubby kinds of things, because if it's too thin, it breaks. So you want something that holds, has, an, has a certain amount of mass that won't break as easily. So, uh, so one of the things here, too, is that we often say that things are, we have uh, people that aren't skilled at flint napping and find thick, clubby tools. But oftentimes, it's the raw material that's thick and clubby. And it makes a test takes a pretty good napper to knock one of those things out of there. So one of the things that we start to see, and we talked about this a little bit, was the notching here. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of that for you. Notching is a pretty important st step that we see in, in archaeology, on an archaeological record in a variety of places in the world. This is a technology that only produces a certain style of flake here. Let's so get one out here. They are round, little round flakes. And the only way you get these, and 
You tend to find more than just one of these things. You find hundreds of them oftentimes. But they show that this notching is going on. And we find these only at certain time periods. In, in the Middle East, Europe, and North Africa, we find this starting up at about 17,000 years ago. In North America, we start finding this about between six and 7,000 years ago. And it shows an adjustment to the environment and technology and what they're doing in hunting. Uh, so it gives us a time frame as well, very diagnostic kinds of flakes. Uh, and you can only make them this way. Um, so let me finish notching this one up here and we'll be done. I almost, almost use those uh, pair of matched earrings. Yeah. Well, see, this is what we find is in other parts of the world, for example, like in Mesoamerica, where we see some of the finest stone tool work ever made. Uh, these people are doing things that are, particularly the Mayans, and are doing these things called uh, eccentrics. They're making these staff heads that are like this, that have like seven Mayan faces chipped along the outer edges, and the entire center of it hollowed out. They're making giant rings of obsidian, these little rings of obsidian all hollowed out. They're making these beads that are like inch and a half long with a millimeter hole drilled all the way through it. There are things that, you know, that, are, that are, one, took a lot of time for them to do. Um, so they were also carving the stuff. One of the things that we see down in, in Mesoamerica is uh, uh, one of the things that was stolen and recovered out of the museum in, in Mexico City was a six-foot carving out of obsidian of an Aztec warrior. Um, so, so essentially, when we're done here, what, what they did is, this is something we see under a microscope, is, is that they notched these things first, and then they came back up here and resharpened them. And that seems to make some sense that when I go through the whole process of finishing it all up and then notching it and breaking it, and one of the things that we can tell is this is exactly what they're doing is by taking a look at, at the patterning and we see these notching flakes overlap the finishing, or the finishing flakes overlap the notching flakes so that one of the things that we can see is the, the steps that they go through to make these kind of things. Okay, so. So this is a technology that Native Americans were doing eight, 9,000 years ago. Not the blade, not the notching, that was five to 6,000 years, but the grinding that you see me doing here, we see this off a lot of the New World materials that we don't find elsewhere in the world. And this preparation of edge allows them to put on this super serrated sharp edge that, uh, that I can put on here. Let me get this done here, I'm almost done. I've got a little bit of time, then we can I can do a couple other things and show you what. Now, one of the things here on the Northwest Coast, this is a, gets back to women flint knappers, is that when Lewis and Clark were climbing up the Columbia River, one of the things that they seen or saw was that on some of the Chinook women were literally hundreds of these little arrowheads that were danglies on their dresses. And these are classically points that we call, you know, Columbia River bird points or gem points, and they're often these little bitty things, no bigger, about eighth of an inch to about a three-eighths of an inch big, and they're just teeny weeny tiny things, and we find millions of them here on the Northwest Coast, little bitty, little bitty ones, and uh, so it's hard to say these days in anthropology and archaeology when you find these things, when somebody comes to me and says, what is this? I have to go, I don't know. Maybe it's an arrowhead, maybe it's a projector point, maybe it's a stone tool, maybe it's decorate directions. Uh, one of the things that we can do um, is a stylistic thing now, or excuse me, not stylistic, but a blood analysis. We can analyze stone tools, the materials on stone tools for at least a million and a half years old. Let me show you how sharp this is. I'm pretty much done with this now, but it's putting an edge that's just as sharp as one of those flake edges. So Native Americans took stone tool making one step beyond where we had to. They did some incredible work. Um, when all you have to do is knock off one of these little bitty flakes instead of having to go through the stylistic technology. Uh, pretty amazing in terms of what they were able to do with this material.